Amen. Mark chapter 16. So, of course, the story of the ladies going to the tomb and seeing um, that Jesus was risen. Um, happy Resurrection Day, and that's the, the day that um, is marked down in the Bible here in Mark chapter 16 when they discovered the empty tomb. So, of course, um, they are there on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. A lot of, uh, I'm not preaching on when Jesus was crucified or the timeline of that event's um, this morning, but I believe Jesus was crucified um, on Wednesday. The Bible is pretty clear about that. Many people think, you know, Good Friday. Good Friday makes no sense at all, you know, for three days and three nights in the tomb. There's no way to basically figure out um, that Jesus, you know, to, you know, one does not equal three, basically. So um, I believe that Wednesday is the best explanation. Thursday's got some credibility as well, but it's definitely not Friday. So they go to the tomb early Thursday morning. I'm sorry, early Sunday morning, and they see that Jesus is in the tomb. In Matthew 12, verse 40, the Bible says this, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he was put in the tomb early Thursday morning. You have Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. That's three, okay? That's three days and three nights. But look down at Mark chapter 16, and we come to early Sunday morning. So early Sunday morning, um, like the, a, the early a.m. hours of Sunday morning, and it says when the Sabbath was passed, which is Saturday, remember there was two Sabbaths because of the Passover, but Saturday was the regular weekly Sabbath, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? So this morning, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Savior of the world. Amen. And what does that mean for us? And what I want to do this morning is kind of have a little bit different take um, on the resurrection. You say, you know, it's kind of hard as a pastor, like you preach uh, you know, on Easter, it's the same message or the same, but there's always a different way of looking at things in the Bible. There's always a different way. Um, the Bible is infinite, so it's really not that difficult to come up with different Easter messages. But this morning, I want to look at a phrase that is in the Bible that's not in Mark chapter 16. Go to Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 20. So we're celebrating the risen Savior, the risen Jesus Christ um, this morning. And there's a phrase that is used to describe God in the Bible, and it is uh, numerous times in the Bible, dozens of times in the Bible, you will see this phrase describing God. And I think that fits, this phrase fits perfectly for a resurrection uh, Sunday, a resurrection, a day where we celebrate the risen Jesus Christ, uh, the source of our salvation. Look down at Jeremiah chapter 10. And look at verse number 20. Let me just give you one instance of this phrase used to describe God. The Bible says this in verse number 10, or verse number, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse number 10. The Bible says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. So as we celebrate the resurrection this morning, I really want to focus in on this phrase, the living God. Amen. The living God. Over and over and over in the Bible, we see God described as what? Not just God, as the living God. Like, like he's the only one. Like there's not another one. He's not a living God. He is the living God. God. It's, look, it's, a, it's one of the ultimate demonstrations of this attribute of God, you know, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you three points this morning on this idea that we serve a living God this morning. The first one is this. The first one is this, and it's demonstrated through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the first point is very simple, and I won't spend a lot on this first point, but the living God, the living God is the only way we can live. The only way that we can live spiritually is through the living God. And that is not an accident. It is only through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can live. It is only through that. 
Turn to John chapter 14, verse number 6. Look, you said that seems pretty simple, Pastor. Well, it's not that simple to people today. It's not that simple to people today. I had somebody just, I talked to yesterday. My wife went and we did some uh, visits yesterday. And I had somebody tell me yesterday that I had never met before, never talked to. Um, well, you know, God, he's got a lot of different names. And everybody, certain people call God different names. And, but we all worship the same God. Wrong! Amen. We do not all worship the same God. Look down at John chapter 14 in verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Notice, I mean, look, you should read this verse with the proper emphasis. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Meaning, there's only one way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When you see the little bumper stickers, they always leave that part of the verse off. When you see the little refrigerator mag magnets, they always leave that part off. I am the way, the truth, and the life, end statement. That's not the whole verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So I told that man yesterday, a very nice way, as I stood in his yard, I told him, no, that's not correct. <laughs> There's only one way. There's only one name. I mean, the Bible literally says this. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way to be saved. So when somebody comes up to you and says, how, you know, you ask somebody how you get to heaven, and they say, well, just have faith in God. Just have faith in God. What's God's name? Well, you know, his name is Jesus. That's who it is. That's the only name. That is the only name that you can trust in that will actually lead you to salvation. It's not just God. He has a lot of names. The living God has only one only begotten Son. And that is the name that we must trust on for salvation. So it is only through the living God. The first point is very simple. The living God. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. The living God is the only way that man can live. Look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 16. Jesus asked Peter this question. Jesus asked Peter, who do you think that I am? Who, who do people say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And look what Peter says in verse number 16 of Matthew 16. And Simon Peter asked him and said, Thou art the Christ, the what? The Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Without the Son of the living God... And without this, this event that we celebrate this morning, there is no chance of life. Jesus Christ is the only way. The world doesn't want to say that today. Christian churches don't want to say that today. Billy Graham didn't even say that. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ is is the only way. If we care about people, that's what we will tell them. We are not here to lie to people. Some pastor that will get up and tell you that God has many names and all these different things and he doesn't really care about anything is a, is a liar and a fraud and does not love the people that he is talking to. Without Jesus Christ and the resurrection, there is no chance of life. It's not complicated. But people don't want to hear these truths today. Here's the second point. Turn to Daniel chapter 6. There's too many examples in the Bible of this one, but I just chose Daniel chapter 6. I really like Daniel in the Bible. Not just because it's my middle name, but Daniel is just such a great character in the Bible. Look at Daniel chapter 6, and the second point is this. The second point is this. The living God is active. The living God is active. This isn't... You know, the Bible does not teach a God that is a God of deism. You know, this, this deist idea of, you know, this God that just kind of made everything, set everything in motion, and then doesn't get involved. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the biggest example in the Bible of God being active, of God being involved, of God getting involved in the lives of men. Look at Daniel chapter 6 for another example. 
Daniel chapter 6, Daniel finds himself in trouble here under Persian rule. Remember, Daniel, he, is, he was a, a prophet during the Babylonian captivity, when the lower kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire. Just a few years later, the Babylonian Empire, Daniel quickly rose to second in command of the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar, and then they were taken over by the Persians just a few years after the captivity. So one empire replaced by another empire, but Daniel was so valuable that they're like, hey, we're overthrowing this entire empire and just wiping everybody out, but we're keeping this guy. And we're not only keeping this guy, but we're putting him second in charge too. Basically, the prince of Persia, the king of Persia, puts Daniel in, in charge of everything. Look at verse number one. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes. So he's obviously got princes that he's delegating his power to, which should be over the whole kingdom. And of, of these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. So there was three, there was... 120 princes, there was three presidents over those princes, and then Daniel was top of those three, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and that the king should have no damage. So this king delegates his authority well. Then Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. All the other rulers didn't like this. They didn't like that Daniel was liked and, and favored amongst the king. But look, this is a perfect example that it is God that promotes. It is God that promotes. Don't go to work and say, oh, if I, if I follow you know, what all these you know, rules are here. No, no, no. You go and you follow the Bible. You go and you follow the, the morals and the teachings of what God tells you to do in the Bible, and God will promote you. You don't go and say, oh, if I just go and break all these rules like everybody else is breaking all these rules, then I can get ahead. No, it is God that promotes. And Daniel is a perfect example of this. Then the presidents and princes, they're, they're, they're conspiring against him. It's a real-life conspiracy here. Then said these men, verse 5, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They're like, he doesn't do anything illegal. What are we going to do? We're going to have to make something up here that goes against his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together the king and said unto him, thus unto him, King Darius, live forever, flatterers. <clears throat> All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days save of the king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So they make this rule make this rule that you can't worship any god or even consult any other authority. They know Daniel prays, what was it, three times a day, no matter what. They're like, king, for a whole month, we're going to have anyone, they're only allowed to consult you, no matter what. And the king, you know, probably a prideful person, falls for this flattery, and he says, wow, that sounds pretty good. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. So, the Medes and the Persians, they had a, a rule that once you signed a law, even the king himself couldn't go against it. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Skip down to verse number 13. Keep in mind that the king loves Daniel. That's why he favors him. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. He's still praying three times a day, they're saying. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. He's like, oh, they tricked me, these people. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. So he tried to figure out a way to get around this law. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king, and he said unto the king, Now, O king, that the law of, know, that the law, know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute with the king established may be changed. So they got Daniel in this case. Very foolish men, by the way. Do they think that the king is happy with them at this point? That's another story in itself. But skip down to verse number 20. So the king had to throw Daniel into the lion's den, and he did it. But then right away, after the sentence is carried out, after he was in the lion's den for a night, he, he rushes down to the lion's den. And look what he says in verse number 20. The king goes to Daniel, and he came to the den, and he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and, the, and he spake unto Daniel. He said, O Daniel, servant of what? Servant of the living God, is thy God 
whom thou servest continually, able to deliver ye thee from the lions? What was the answer? The answer was yes. The living God intervenes. The living God is not some God that sets some... Our God is not some God that set things in motion and does not intervene. And as he intervened for Daniel, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. As he intervened for Daniel, he intervenes today. He intervenes for people, both saved and unsaved, today. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 33. I mean, how in the world did all these normal, uneducated, weak men throughout the Bible and women throughout the Bible, how did they achieve the things that they achieved? Why did God use the, the weakest? Why did he use? Why did he use a bunch of fishermen? Why did he use people that were just normal people to, you know, use the Holy Spirit through them? to witness for him, to, to start this, this movement that started after the resurrection. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. The Bible says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Look at this. Stopped the mouth of lions. Quenched the violence of fire. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? A very similar situation. Literally thrown into a furnace that was so hot that the people that threw them in were burned up. And the living God intervened. The living God saved them who escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Weak people subdued nations. Through what? Through the power of the living God who intervenes. Waxed valiant in fight. People that weren't valiant became strong in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. How in the world did they enter the promised land with Joshua and defeat these nations that were stronger than them? And defeat all these armies that were bigger than them? There's no military explanation to it. There's no military explanation. I, I was just telling some of the guys, I'm reading a, a book, an eyewitness account of the last two years of the Civil War. And one of the most interesting things about the book is it's a lot of military strategy and numbers on how many people the Union lost versus the Confederacy. The Union lost um, more people than the Confederacy by a long ways. Because typically an offensive operation is more costly for an army. These are just military strategies. I mean, there's, there's one-offs where one general is exceptionally smart and one general is exceptionally stupid and things like that. Then there's things like Thermopylae where there's some, you know, just new military, you know, thing um, introduced or theory or strategy introduced. But in general, an army that constantly is on the offensive will just simply lose more people. It is really the army, that, the army that wins is the bigger army, the nation with more resources that can continue to fund and just replace and build more weapons and build more equipment and throw more men at the situation. That's typical of military strategy, and you'll see that throughout military history. However, the nation of Israel, they crossed the river, and they, they just defied all of that. Why? Because they had on their side the living God. That's why. And that's why God used weaker armies and weaker men because he wanted people to be able to look back and say, that doesn't make sense. Yep. Something else must have been going on there. Amen. Something else must have been intervening there because this goes against any strategy or any theory that you know, men could put together. This is why the spies came back and 10 of the spies, before they even went to battle, 10 of the spies, they said, this doesn't make any sense that we would go to war against these people. There's more of them, they're bigger, they're stronger, we're going to lose. But what do they lack? Through faith they subdued kingdoms. We'll get to that one in just a second. Back to the point I'm trying to make here. The living God intervenes. The living God is active with mankind. From the beginning, it will be like that until the end. So you see these people that say, like, oh, you know, God is some magic man in the sky. You worship some, you know, fairy tale. Or, you know, the mistake the unsaved make when they say things like that, they assume that we worship a God 
that is make-believe. But no, we, we worship an active living God. And it makes no sense that he's not active and he's not, he hasn't been intervening because we've been seeing it happen throughout history. We see it happen in our lives. But just because they think that because they have never personally seen him or seen him, they think that they've never seen him or they think that they've never seen him intervene in their lives. This is what people think today. But the truth is, <coughs> they have seen him. And he has intervened in their lives. Some people, many people, I don't like reporting this, but the, the, probably the majority of people have simply hardened their hearts to be able to ignore it. I can give you examples of this from just a few days ago. If you're a soul winner, you know this. I was talking to a, a person earlier this week. I, I was talking to this person at their door, and this young man was about to go to jail. He was telling me how he's about to go to jail, and he, he got in this situation where he assaulted somebody, and he's, he's going to go to jail for, he said, for, you know, maybe a year or so. And he said, he said that <clears throat> he got into some altercation, and he said, you know, I've just really been pressed lately. He said, it's funny you're here. So because I've really been pressed lately that, you know, on all these questions, like, where am I going to go? Because what did I ask him? I asked him if he knew he was going to go to heaven. And he said, boy, I've really been thinking a lot about that lately. Because of this situation that is happening to me. And you could tell he was worried about it. He was worried about it. He did it. He did it. He told me it was stupid. I should have done it. I should have done it. I got an altercation with somebody and I just, I just, you know, I should have never gotten physical and I just, but, but since this, all these questions have been coming into my mind. I've just been thinking about all these things that you're bringing up to me. I've been thinking about them a lot in the last couple of weeks, he says to me. And he says, I know. And I, he says, I know I shouldn't have done what I did. I said, how did you know that? He's not saved. He doesn't know a word of the Bible. How did you know it was wrong? He's the one that told me that. I didn't tell him that. I'm not lecturing him on what he did. He says, I know it was wrong. I said, how did you know that it was wrong? I told him. I said, you have a living God that wrote his law in your heart. That's how you know. Because when you were born into this world, God wrote that law down in your heart. And that's how you're standing there today. You know nothing of what the Bible says, and you're telling me what you did was wrong. Tell me that's not God intervening for you. You have a living God. You have to ignore him. You have to shut it off. You think it's an accident? Some Baptist pastor walks into your driveway, and here you stand? Just yesterday, Benjamin ran into the same type of people. This man and his wife, man, we've been talking about this for the last two days nonstop. You think it's an accident that we're here answering the questions that you've been asking each other for two days? You're just like, you just want to like, like, what in the world? I mean, I'm not saying we should, you know, smack someone with the Bible, but I mean, hello? People ignore him, though. He is active. He is there. He did write the law. He wrote the law for a reason. So you would have moments like that. Turn to Romans chapter 1. It's good to tell people when you get in situations like that. It's good to tell people, like, do you think that it's an accident that I'm here with the Bible? Look, I'm nobody special, but I'm standing here with the Word of God. And I'm willing to explain it to you. I'm, I'm no more special than you are. I'm just here with the answers in my hand. God is real. He's alive. He's active. Look at Romans chapter 1. People have just gotten very good at ignoring him. And because of, I mean, look, because of this, the fact that people are breathing, the fact that they are thinking and contemplating is proof of this living God. 
Look down to Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. The Bible says this, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Everybody is walking around with this law written in their heart, and they are walking around in the creation that God has made. And the fact that their conscience, that their consciousness, the fact that these questions keep coming into their mind is proof that God intervenes. But you can ignore Him. You can ignore Him. And if you read the rest of Romans 1, you can turn against Him. It's possible. But it's the, see, it's the world around us. And it's the cares. I'm talking about man's world around us. And it's the cares of man's world around us. It's the lusts of the flesh around us that suppress the natural search for the living God that is in every man. But he's there, and there's evidence of it for every single person who has ever lived. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So the living God is the only way that we can achieve life or that any man can achieve life. The living God is active. We don't serve some inactive God that can't be seen, that can't be experience, because God is and always will be active. The third one is this, and this isn't one you're going to hear a lot today, but the third one is this, because we have a living God, and the only way to life is through the living God, and the only way, and that living God is active, the living God should be feared. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, and look at verse number 26. You say, by who? By everyone. By both the unsaved and the saved. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 26. The Bible says this. This is for somebody who is saved and is just abusing God's grace. Because look, if you're saved this morning, nothing's going to make you unsaved. You were saved as a gift. You were saved by trusting on the risen Jesus Christ that we celebrate this morning. You're not saved by 0.1% of anything that you've done. If you think that, you're not saved. You're saved by trusting in Jesus Christ. You're saved by trusting in the Son of the living God. But you go ahead and abuse that, there's going to be chastisement coming your way. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. It's like God's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. I've saved with you. I've saved you. I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit. There's only one thing I can do with you. I'm not sending Jesus to die for you again. I'm not just going to have Jesus come and die every, you know, five minutes, which is what you would need. It's like there's no more sacrifice for sins. Instead, a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You know, look, everybody that, that died under God's judgment under Moses, that, that, they're not in hell. Like whether they trusted in, in the, the coming Savior is when, whether they're in hell or not. It's just saying like they literally died though. They physically died. Oh, how much sore punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. This is the Christian who's like, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Hey, great. I'm glad you know that. And then they just despise God. They don't live according to how God wants them to live. And he says, what's going to happen to that person? He says, we know that he has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge who? His people. It is a fearful thing. He's talking to save people here. He's talking to save people, trying to wake them up on the chastisement of God. Look, the chastisement of God on the believer, on your life on this earth, is nothing to shake a stick at. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to wake people up. You will find people. I even asked this question myself before I was saved and somebody gave me the gospel. I even asked somebody myself. They're telling me the gospel's free. All I have to do is just trust on Jesus. And I'm like, you're telling me I can be a drunk and beat my wife and I'll still go to heaven? 
as long as I trust in Jesus? And the answer is yes. But God will beat me. God will beat me possibly to death, is what Hebrews 10 is saying. The chastisement of God is nothing to joke about. I mean, you're saved. Great. But don't abuse that because God will chastise his people severely. And look, as far as the unsaved goes, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. <clears throat> as far as the unsaved goes, they should fear the Lord as well. But they won't as much as they should, just you know, because they don't take him seriously. But they should, and people in the Bible knew this. David knew this. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, and look at verse 26. Goliath was coming out, and he was challenging the army of Israel. He was challenging the army of Israel, and he was just making fun of them, and they were all just terrified and in fear. And David was just like, look at his reaction here. Look what he says in verse 26. David knew that Goliath should fear God. Goliath knew that even these pagan people, even though they didn't, they should. Look at verse number 26. It says, And David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. And he's saying, look, it's an embarrassing thing. Israel has repro reproach upon it because they are allowing somebody like this. And look at this. Look what he says. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? This unbeliever is what he's saying. That he should defy the armies of what? Of the living God. You know what David is saying? Doesn't this guy know that God intervenes? Doesn't this guy know that God is active? Doesn't this guy know? I mean, I mean, he hears what Goliath is saying. He's like, he's afraid for him. He's like, he's defying the armies, not of Israel. He's defying the armies of the living God. Amen. David was insulted for God. Look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 19. Same thing with the armies of Syria and, and, and Rab, Rabshake, who comes and just starts insulting God. 2 Kings chapter 19, look at verse number 4. <clears throat> Everybody, saved and unsaved, should fear the living God. Amen. Look at 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 4. The Bible says it may be the Lord God will hear all the words of Rabshake, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to what? To reproach the living God. And he will reprove the words which the Lord God hath heard, Wherefore, lift up thy prayer unto the remnant that are left. They're saying, like, we should, we should pray that God intervenes here. And what did God do? He intervened. Nations that reproach the living God are systematically destroyed. If you don't get a theme from the Bible, look, nations are not individuals. Nations are judged on this earth. You are not saved as a nation. You are saved as an individual belief or not belief. Nations are judged now. And you just see that again and again and again in the Old Testament. Why do you think it's there? Nations that, now think about this. Nations that reproach the living God are judged harshly on this earth. Do you, do you believe me? Our president a couple days ago declared Easter Sunday as Trans Recognition Day. That's real. I had to read it twice. That's a real thing. That really happened. That will not go unanswered. That will not go unanswered. Why? Because everybody should fear the living God. Why? Because God intervenes. Not because of anything I will do or you will do, but because God is active and he's a living God. And people that reproach him nations that reproach him will, will be destroyed. I actually think that there's a silver lining here, and I'm going to talk about that tonight. I'm not going to get too into that this evening. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter, or this morning. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. I mean, everyone should fear the living God. This is, you know, churches that are removing um, all of, all, you know, talk of hell. Churches that are removing all of God's wrath so they can be nicer. And I can just tell you how to get a bigger bank account or whatever they care about. And then we'll send a financial advisor to your house and tell you how you can, you know, um, give more money to us. Hello, what are people doing in these churches? What are people doing listening to this? 
What are Christians who are saved and believe the Bible doing listening to this garbage? Amen. The living God is active, and the living God should be feared by everyone. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. My last point is this. <coughs> My last point is this, and this is really for us this morning. They're all for us this morning. But this one really I want you to focus on. The living God should be trusted. Amen. The living God should be trusted. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, it says, Therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Guess what? As you live amongst a nation that... It at least has leaders that suffer, you know, that reproach the living God at this time anyway. You will be reproached. Because, why? Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. This is such a great verse here. It's just, it totally disproves Calvinism in this one verse. It says, this living God, we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. You know what those last two points of that, that verse say? They say that God is the, it, it proves God wants all to be saved. It calls God the Savior of all men. God wants to be. It is His will that all men should be saved. That is what God wants. It is not God's fault that people ignore Him. It is not God's fault that people turn against him. It is not God's fault that people decide to hate him. God wants all. It is his will that all would be saved, especially of those that believe, but only those that believe will be saved. See what it's saying there? Doesn't that make perfect sense? So look, I, I, I pray that you're all saved this morning, and if you're not, ask somebody after service. But you were saved through trust Amen. in the living God. You were saved through the, the trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of God's Son, the Son of the living God. You were not saved by following Him. You were not saved by turning from your sins or repenting of sins or whatever you want to call it. You were only saved by trusting in Him. But guess what? You had at least enough faith to trust in Jesus for your salvation, which, guess what? You got something from. You got, you were given eternal life personally for that. So my question for you this morning is this. Why can't you then trust in the rest of his word? Why can't you trust him going forward in your Christian life? Why would somebody get saved and then never even open the Bible to see what God has for their life going forward. Why would they not do that? Why can't we trust the Word of the living God? Because God doesn't just give us this path to salvation. He tells us, hey, now here's what I want you to do. I mean, wasn't that Mark 16? The end of Mark 16, Jesus literally saying, hey, there you go. Now go tell everybody else. He tells you what to do now. He didn't just save you. He tells you what to do now. I mean, you've got something out of salvation. I mean, personally, at this point, I don't, I, I can't, it's harder and harder for me to believe every single day that people would choose the way of this world over the Word of God. I mean, who in the world? This is just from my viewpoint. <coughs> Who in the world could look at this country? What believer could look at this country and the things that are happening and conclude that the Bible is the problem? I mean, what in the world? Who, who could do that? In, in, uh, in South Dakota, and I guess Georgia, they passed some new law, right, like literally limits free speech. Isn't South Dakota, this governor of South Dakota, like all the conservatives like, oh, pass a law that literally makes it illegal to preach that you, look, to preach that it was the Jews that killed Jesus. She makes like Matthew 24 illegal. <laughs> look, I'm not, look, I'm not mad at, at people that are of the Jewish religion, but they need to hear the gospel. But to be, I mean, to pass laws that are against preaching the truth? 
Look, folks, you cannot choose Jesus Christ and the religion responsible for killing him. I mean, I mean, how backwards must you be to believe that the Bible is the problem today? I mean, I, I preached a sermon. I preached a sermon at First Works called "Honky Tonk Hip Hop," and I compared the themes of hip hop music versus country music. And you know what my first point was in the sermon? My first point was hip hop, especially, but they both kind of do. Hip hop, especially, promotes the abuse of women. And somebody said to me a couple days ago, they're like, man, that sermon was prophetic. Because, you know, P. Dummy or whatever his name is, is being arrested for abusing women and all this stuff. <clears throat> He's been singing about it for 30 years. He's been singing music and, and promoting people that sing music. It's like, hey, we abuse women for 30 years. And I'm some prophet. What in the world? I mean, they're telling you what they're doing. They're telling you, we worship the devil. And they was like, well, they worship the devil? They're telling you, we want your kids. We want to we grab your kids. We want to pervert their minds. We want to destroy them. People are like, they're after our kids? Can that be true? They're telling you. They're telling you. They're coming out and they're saying it. How backwards must you be? Or how, how, how far, how far into the sand must your head be? To be like, well, I think the Bible the problem. Facebook now is, is graying out Bible verse posts. We have to click an extra button where it says, like, this, this is sensitive. I don't even know what it says. Like, sensitive or graphic or violent content. And then it's like a King James Bible verse. Because, yeah, the, you know, the, the Bible is the problem. We're done with Facebook, by the way. Church announcement. I told the online, the online uh, manager, blow us out of this thing. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Why? Because it's bad. It's completely all bad. I'll preach a whole sermon on it, or I'll tell you after church, or whatever you want. But it's all bad. There's nothing good there. There's nothing good there. But look, I'll talk about the craziness of a lot of this tonight and how there's a big silver lining here. And I do believe that there is a silver lining here. But the point is this. Back to the point. <coughs> the clowns of clown world. And the less separated, from, less separated from it you become, some of the things in the Bible might even seem to be radical to you. If you don't know what's in the Bible. And all you do is fill your head with the garbage that this world wants to fill, fill you with. I mean, don't hold illogical positions as a Christian. You can't, don't think that you can do what everybody else does don't think that you can go where they go. Don't think that you can see what they see. Don't think that you can engage in what they engage in. Don't think that you can speak like they speak, think like they think, and suddenly you won't reap what they reap. You won't become unsaved, but you will reap. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. If you don't want those results, then you need to trust the living God. I mean, thankfully, he gave you his word. But people, they'll get so entrenched in worldly things that maybe even the Bible seems extreme to even a person that is saved. There's less and less and less knowledge of the Bible out there, folks. It's not getting any better. I meet more and more people every single month, every single year that, don't, that haven't even heard of Jesus. Especially young people. Typically people would have heard of Jesus five years ago. Now you're meeting a lot of young people never even heard of Him. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. We must, as saved believers, we must still trust the living God. We must trust His Word. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. The Bible says this, what? It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. 
As things get crazier and crazier, thine own understanding is going to get worse and worse. The temptations of the flesh are going to get worse and worse. The lusts they put in front of you, even as a believer, are going to get worse and worse. Satan can't make you unsaved, but he can make you unprofitable. Just trust in the Lord. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. He'll tell you everything what you need to do. You don't even need to know anything. Well, you know what it means? If you, look, if you just knew, it wouldn't be trust. If you just knew, it wouldn't be trust. Even if you're, you read something in the Bible, you just have to accept this. Like, hey, you know what? If you read it, do it. Yes, if you hear it preached, just implement it. That's what trust means. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Me, not under thy own understanding. You've been corrupted. You've been corrupted. Look at Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24, verse number 35. <laughs> Matthew 24, look at verse number 35. See, Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. Amen. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. We have the Word of God. Amen. We have the answer. It's just, it's just a willingness to trust in it. Notice at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11, when it talked about all those wonderful things that those people were able to accomplish, all those weak men and women were able to accomplish, how does the chapter start out? It says, through faith. Why? Because they trusted. Daniel's like, Whatever, I guess. I'm not stopping praying. I'm just going to trust what God says. And you know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I love their statement. I'm going to paraphrase it, but they're like, if God saves us, he saves us. If not, he, he doesn't. Whatever. We're not going against his word. They trust his word. Like, I'm following the Lord. Kill me. Whatever. I'm following the Lord. You can't go to church anymore. Hey, whatever. Do your worst. I'm following the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll follow the Lord. Because you know what? I'm way more afraid of him than I am of any man. I, I get it. There's people that can put fear in you. And, and we shouldn't have that fear. But look, we're men. We're women. We're flesh. You just, you just fear the Lord. Fear the Lord more. I'm way more afraid of God than I am of, of you or anybody in this world. Look, folks, Jesus is the Word, Amen. and He's risen, Amen. and His Word will not pass away. He's the eternal King. Amen. That means it's just like forever, forever He's the King. We have a living God this Easter morning. We have a living God that is active on this earth with us. Amen. That is not, look, Jesus was here and He lived what you're living. Amen. He lived the temptations that you can't get away from. He lived all these things and he succeeded against them all, yet without sin. He lived amongst, he lived amongst a nation that was way worse than ours. That was way sicker and anti-God than ours. This Roman Empire that was of Jesus' time. But guess what? He's here and he's available to you. His word is sitting right in front of you this morning he wants, not only wants you to be saved, but he wants you to follow him after salvation. And he gave you instructions to do so. So look, trust, trust in this. Amen. Trust in this, this Easter morning. You say, what did you learn Easter morning? You, you already knew that Jesus rose from the dead when he came to church this morning. But you learned that you should trust him in everything. Amen. Just trust him in everything. And you know what? The more you trust him in everything, the more sense... It just, like, you may not like it, but it, just, it makes perfect sense. I'm not confused about anything that's happening today. I don't like seeing it. I don't like people reproaching the living God, but I'm not confused about anything. There's a lot of people that are confused. People tell me that all the time. Older lady yesterday, beautiful, wonderful older lady my wife sat down and, and visited with yesterday, just gave us just like, it's crazy out here. It's crazy. And she's pointing to like, her front door. And I'm like, Agree, 100%. But 
But here's the thing, folks. Take advantage of this. Take advantage of this because who's going to hurt you when you have that? Who can do anything to you when you trust in the living God in everything that you do? When you just have Jesus directing your paths? I mean, there will be, there will be no excuse. Turn to, or just look at the front of your bulletin. I'll read for you Philippians 2. There will be no excuse for anyone. Like, there's so many people, Pastor, that have no interest in the Bible. They're not going to get saved. They don't seem to want to care if they're going to heaven or not. But at the name of Jesus, every knee. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Amen. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It, it, many people, when they do that, it will be too late. Right. When you've been in hell for thousands of years and you're pulled out and you're standing in front of Jesus Christ, it's too late for you but that tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord right before they're thrown into the lake of fire. We have a living God this morning. Jesus really rose from the dead. He was seen by hundreds of people. It was not a hidden resurrection. That's why I put this as the verse of the week. He was seen above 500 brethren at once. The resurrecting of Jesus Christ was not hidden from anybody. Neither will his second coming be hidden from anybody. It's not going to be poof when all your clothes are sitting here and I'm like, you know, well, I guess I'm gone too. That, that wouldn't make any sense. Everyone will see Jesus coming back. It's not some fantasy book where it's going to be hidden because we have a living God who is real, he's active, he's involved, and he should be feared and he should be followed by us especially. So happy Resurrection Day. Happy Living God Day. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.